Thank you so, so very much for being a part of our services. Uh, it is such a wonderful time every, and it, it, every time we get a chance to come together. God just seems to do something uh, above and beyond our expectations, right? And so we're glad that you're here. Thank you, visitors, for coming out and being a part of our services as well. It's always good to see new faces in amongst our midst today. Just a couple of real quick announcements. Number The first thing is we're having a men's prayer supper that is going to be on Saturday, May the 13th at 6 o'clock at Chuck Claiborne. Chuck, wave your hand. It's at his house at 6 o'clock on uh, th uh, Saturday, May the 13th. So that's for all the men. We'd like for you to sign up if you're going to be there because he's planning on cooking steak and he doesn't want to cook too much. So... <laughs> <laughs> so if you could sign up that you would that you're going to try to be there and i appreciate that where is paul and candy at are they have you if you've noticed somebody here in the next little bit standing around with taking a whole bunch of pictures and uh he and his wife how many of you have enjoyed the uptick in our social media have you, any of you noticed that recently you ought to check out our new website. He, he, he completely redid our website. It's all upgraded, all brand new. Our website, our presence in social media has taken a huge uh, upswing in uh, people watching it, people seeing it. Well, it's all due to uh, Paul and Candy uh, Sinar. And they're here with us today. They live in Iowa. But that's one thing about technology. You can do it from anywhere, right? So, but we're certainly glad they're friends of ours from years back, but we're glad that they're here today taking a bunch of pictures. So if you see your shot in, the, in, in, a, in something so connected with social media in the next few weeks, today's the day he did it. So everybody put on their, put on their good makeup, okay? <laughs> let's all stand. Let's sing a few songs together. Let's do something serious. How's that? Every day I find my heart is close and drawn. He's fairer than the glory of the golden purple dawn. He's all my fancy pictures, his fairest dreams and more. He's thing he grows to sweeter than he was the day before. The hand cannot be fancy. There we go. This side of the golden shore. My longing spirit on and on Each day he grows to sweeter than he was the day before The half cannot be fancy This side of the golden shore Oh, there will be no sweeter than he ever was before My heart is sometimes heavy, but he comes to sweet relief Pulls me to his bosom when I droop with my degree. I love the Christ who all my burdens in his body bore. His day he grows to sweeter than he was the day before. The hand cannot be fancy. This side the golden shore. Take somebody's hand before you sit down. Would you do that, please? seated. 
That song we just finished was one of those songs, if you take a breath, you're three words behind. So we're going to try to do one just a little bit slower. Down from the cross where my Savior died. Down from the cross where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood of thine. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood of thine. Glory to his name. I am so unjustly saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides with me. saying glory to his name hallelujah praise the lord for what he's done in our lives because it does get sweeter every day doesn't it every day just seems like a better day and a bigger nicer day how gorgeous is today outside by the way it's beautiful another song another song from the songs just a beautiful song as the deer panteth for the water my soul longeth after you song before Steve comes this morning. Uh, we sang this song several times during the, 
the uh, long, 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 long three and a half years he preached on Revelation, but it was just <laughs> <laughs> just a beautiful song talks about the angels singing and what we will be doing when we get there. Worthy is the name that was Lamb who that was slain. It's love. 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you again for this opportunity that we have to come together and to worship you and to wonder it and worth uh, all of that worth to us each and every day. And Father, we ask that you bring uh, Steve to remembrance the words that you've given him, that you've laid upon his heart, that he would be able to speak in such a way that, uh, again, honors you and worships you. And we just praise you for that in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Pearson, did you just pray that I wouldn't forget what I was supposed to say? <laughs> I think you did. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, amen. Okay, let's go. All right, guys, I'm telling you, we're going to be in Zechariah chapter 3, the second vision given to Zechariah, and it is an amazing vision. Now, I think many times in this world in which we live, it's real easy to get distracted and distracted and not live in the joy of our salvation. I think that's very easy to do. It can be sin that distracts us and takes away the joy of our salvation. Or perhaps you're a person in here who doesn't have assurance of your salvation. You don't have confidence. Well, today, this vision that we're going to look at is basically a vision of the work of the cross, of Jesus' work on the cross. And it was written 500 years before the cross. I mean, if you, if you don't have assurance of salvation, then study the Word of God. Study the Word of God because that's where assurance comes from. The word was given to us so that we can have assurance. And this, God's word is amazing. It's incredible. And this is one of my, well, one of my favorite chapters in the book of Zechariah, but all the Bible also. So in this vision, there are going to be three main characters that we're going to be looking at. And let's start in verse 1 of chapter 3. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Now, take note of a couple things here. There's three main characters. The first one is the angel of the Lord. And I've told you my opinion, and I think you'll see most definitely today through this scripture that the angel of the Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we have here Joshua the high priest. Now, Joshua is a representation. He is the high priest, but he is a spiritual representation of Israel, of God's people. And then we have somebody else here also, our enemy, the destroyer, the liar, the accuser, Satan himself, the roaring lion who roams about looking for someone to devour is also here. And what is he doing to Joshua the high priest? He's accusing him. Now, I want to point out something here you may not have noticed in the scripture, but both Joshua the high priest is standing before the angel of the Lord. Okay? And then on his right is Satan. So who is in control of the room? Jesus Christ, they're both coming before the risen Lord Jesus Christ. They're standing before him. Now, Satan is accusing him and probably accusing him and probably not even having to tell lies. He's probably just telling the truth. So now, I find this interesting because there's several visions like this in the Bible. We can look at, uh, turn now to Job. I want to look at one here also that is similar to this. In the book of Job, starting in chapter 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Then Satan answered, from, answered the Lord and said, from roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. He was looking for someone to destroy. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? <laughs> Thanks God, if <laughs> you're Job. For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has. He will surely curse you to your face. Then the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power, only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. Now that's a kind of a scary text, isn't it? But God has allowed Satan to do certain things. Now that's good news for us because Satan has his limits. God's placed those limits on him. And here in the vision, who is in control of the room? The angel of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, is in control of the room. And here is Satan, his accuser, pointing at Joshua, the high priest, See, so very similar in text, except Job wasn't present in this vision of seeing Satan come before the Lord. So now I don't know why things happen all the time, but guys, remember, no matter what, 
If you're like Job, you know, what purpose could this serve? That Job's life was pretty much destroyed and then his health was destroyed. What purpose could it serve? Well, look at the book of Job. How many people has this helped through suffering and difficulties to help them understand what's really going on around us? Job served a great purpose and his suffering was not in vain. Suffering not for the Lord is done in vain, but suffering for the Lord is never in vain and always has a purpose. I want to show you an, another one that's similar to this. It's not really a vision, but it's in Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 24. And there arose also a dispute among them as to which one of them was regarded the greatest. So now the disciple, Jesus is about to go to the cross, and the disciples are arguing which one of them is going to be the greatest in the new kingdom that's coming. They're arguing over position. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. Can we say that's true? You didn't even laugh at that. It was, too, it was too close to home to even laugh about. The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it is not this way with you. But the one who is the greatest among you must become like the youngest and the leader like the servant. For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now this verse here had to send chills up Simon's spine. Simon, Simon, notice he didn't call him Peter here. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. So Satan, in the same way, Satan is asking for permission for Peter. Who is in control of the room? The angel of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ is in control. Now, I was thinking about this and to tell you that Jesus said that, how do they thresh wheat? How do you sift wheat? Well, typically that's done on a hilltop where there's more wind. And what you do is you lay the, the heads of grain on, the, on a stone or on a rock, and then you use a flail and you beat it. You beat it. It's a very violent thing. You're breaking away all the hard outer shell. And then what you have next is a pile of seed, wheat seed, and dust and chaff. You have a big mess. So then next what they would do, they would take it, hoping there was a breeze, you would take it and throw it up in the air, and the seed is heavier and would fall down, and the chaff and the dust would be blown away. That's the idea of how it works. But do you see that? He is asking to sift Peter. Well, see, that's going to serve a purpose also. He used the analogy of sifting. Well, it does, don't we all have a hard outer shell after we come to know the Lord that has to just continue to be broken away? so that we can be more pure and more useful for the Lord as seeds? I think so. I think it's a beautiful analogy of what happens. The wind being the spirit and working with us and correcting us and shaping us and God using whatever the case, even if Satan intends it for evil, God will use it for good for those that love him. Now back to Zechariah in verse 2, we see next the Lord speaks Satan is the only one who has spoken up to this point. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? So now Joshua may have a little hope here that he is a brand plucked from the fire. And that reminded me, I've heard before, that John Wesley considered this verse was very personal to him. He even placed... This verse being a brand plucked out of the fire is on his gravestone. But what made it probably as much personal as anything was when he was six years old, he was living in a two-story house, and he was in the top story. And the house was on fire. And he, he couldn't get out. His exit was blocked. And so two men were able to get up to the second-story window and get the window open and get him out. And so when he said it was more personal that, you know, the work of Jesus with him was he was a brand plucked from the fire. We too are a brand plucked from a fire, but it was also very vivid memory he had of that house fire. 
And guys, we need to understand that we, we know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. We are a brand plucked from the fire. We couldn't even get out of it ourselves like John Wesley. He had to have help. And guys, anybody in here or in this world that does not know the Lord Jesus, the house is on fire. You know, the part of the joy of salvation we have, we need to have a sense of urgency to tell people that the house is on fire. You wouldn't allow your neighbors to burn in their house. So part of having the joy of salvation and the assurance of salvation and, and the belief in this is the accurate word of God is also being involved in inviting people, telling people, praying for people, all of those things. It's very important because we, we ourselves, we're a brand that was plucked from the fire. And if you're not a believer in this room, you've never given your life to Jesus, the house is on fire. Save yourself from this wicked generation. Come out of the wicked generation. Come to Christ. Trust Christ for your salvation, and you will be a brand plucked from the fire. You know, the Bible is very clear. In the end, anyone whose name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life will be cast into the lake of fire. A hundred percent of everybody else that doesn't believe in Jesus. And so on this earth, guys, there's only two types of people. It's Democrats and Republicans. No, it's not. <laughs> on this earth, there's only two types of people, believers and unbelievers. That's the only division that really matters because that's the only division that lasts for eternity. So let's get our heads on straight. Let's do what we're supposed to do. Let's invite. Let's tell people about the Lord. Let's carry about the work of the Lord's business because the house is on fire. Now in verse three, I want you to kind of put yourself in Joshua's shoes, because we have a place there too. And Joshua is a representation of God's people, but he's a high priest, but aren't we also priests unto the Lord? He made us so when the veil was torn. We have direct access to the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God among his people. So we also, each and every one of you in here are like priests, high priests. So we can place ourselves in Joshua's probably sandals. Now look at verse 3, what happens next. See, he's a brand plucked from the fire, but look what happens next. <clears throat> now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and standing before the angel. It didn't say he's standing next to Satan. He said he is standing before the angel. Now imagine yourself in this shape. Imagine you have an opportunity to meet the king or a king. You have an opportunity, and, and you realize you're not dressed for the occasion. That would be kind of scary. Maybe you've been in a situation like that. Years ago, Lori and I went to a wedding in Houston, and we thought it was going to be rather casual, and it was not casual in the least. It was very formal. So I rushed over to Lord & Taylor. I don't know if that store still, still even exists, and bought a, a suit jacket and some slacks, and they had to find stuff to fit me, so it was kind of all pieced together. But anyway, I felt much better because I felt so out of place, <clears throat> dressed so casual. But this is nothing like that. Guys, he is standing there, not just dressed casual, he is wearing soiled garments. Now, you know what that means? That soil on his garments is a representation of his sin. So in front of, in front of the king, in front of the Lord of lords, he's standing there, and all of his sin is exposed. Can you imagine the embarrassment can you imagine the shame of standing before the angel of the Lord like that? I mean, what is going to happen? I mean, he has no hope. He was plucked from the fire, but what does that really mean to him at this point? What is the vision going to happen next? He's standing before the angel of the Lord to be judged. I mean, what is going to be the judgment? <clears throat> what could be his defense? To lie? That's a, more, that's a common. Well, that's not going to work. All his sin is exposed. Or, or maybe the, well, God, I'm better than a lot of people. No, that's not going to do it. He is standing before the King of Kings, the holy, righteous Son of God, with sin on his account. It's not going to work. At this point, does he have any hope? Is there any hope at all for the person that stands before the Lord in judgment? Like this, is there any hope that he could possibly have? Certainly he feels like he's 
doomed, that there is no hope. In verse 4, the, Lord, the Lord's eyes turn to him, and the Lord begins to speak about him. Can you imagine the terror that Joshua would have in this vision? Perhaps hanging his head, perhaps a tear rolling down his face, perhaps so shocked. You know, he never says a word in his defense. There's another vision of the, uh, into the Holy of Holies where Isaiah goes and is taken up or it's just a vision, I'm not sure which, I should have reviewed that. But when he comes before the throne, he says, woe is me, for I'm a person of unclean lips. Woe is me, for I come from a people of unclean lips. He recognizes in front of God he can never measure up because the standard is absolute perfection. So Joshua is in the same trouble here, but Joshua can't even make a defense. You know, in this case here, Joshua is standing in sold clothes. Satan doesn't even have to tell a lie. He can just say, look. Look at him. This is what you plucked from the fire? Really? So he was clothed in filthy garments and standing before the angel. Now the angel is going to speak. He spoke and said to those who were standing before him, saying, Remove the filthy garments from him. Again, he said to him, See, I have taken your iniquity away from you and will clothe you with festal robes. Can you imagine how infuriating that is for Satan? And what an incredible relief it is for Joshua. And if you've placed yourself in those shoes, that's the position that we find ourselves in when we come to the cross for the very first time. And he says, remove those things. Remove the filthy garments. Get rid of them. Now look, I told you that this was the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Now who has the authority to forgive sins? God is the only one. Remember that? When, when Jesus, the, in Mark chapter 2, when they let the paralytic down into the room, Jesus, knowing what their thoughts were and what they were going to think, Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Then he said, which is easier to say? If I'm a liar, you know, then I don't, then I don't have the authority to forgive sins. But I can just say that, and who would know, right? But he said, so that you will know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins, pick up your pallet and walk. And he got up and picked up his pallet and walked out of there, proving that the Son of Man had authority to forgive sins. But what did the Pharisees say? No one can forgive sins but God alone. So now look at what this verse says. See, I have taken your iniquity away from you. Now who is speaking? The angel of the Lord. So who removed his sins? Who took the iniquity away from him? The Lord Jesus. Isn't the scripture amazing? This is a vision of the cross, of the New Testament, 500 years before it took place. And here we have the risen Lord here. See, I have taken your iniquity away from you. I don't know if you've ever read the book, The Scarlet Letter, but Hester had to wear a scarlet letter on her breast to, to show the sin that she had, and she could never go in public without it. She had to have it on all the time, all the way until her death in the book by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Joshua standing here in the soiled clothes. Could he ever get out of them? Could he ever get out? Was there any hope? Well, his hope is in the same place as ours. Forgiveness by the Lord Jesus. And do you see, there is hope. We can rip the scarlet letter off of our breast. Our sins have been crucified. Our shame, Christ took our shame on the cross. Our embarrassment, our nakedness, our filthiness, he took it all, and it's gone. You know, I notice here also, Satan hadn't had anything else to say. He's quiet. He said, see, I have taken your iniquity away from you and will clothe you with festal robes. See, now it gets even better, doesn't it? It wasn't that I'll just put some clean other clothes on him, or take his clothes off, wash those clothes, put those back on. No, get rid of those and put on some festal robes. 
put on festal robes. You know what that means? Guys, because of that, remember I was talking about the joy of our salvation? We have to live in the joy of our salvation. And I think so easy a time, I don't know how many years ago or how many decades ago when you were saved, but we need to return to the joy of our salvation. Lay down the stuff that hinders us. Put on the festal robes. We already have them on, but we need to live festal. We need to live it and live in the joy of our salvation. Like I've said many times, there is no part for a woe is me Christian. We live in the time of festal robes. We have the forgiveness of sins. No matter what the conditions are, I promise you, if you're having financial trouble, health trouble, what government trouble, whatever the case, whatever the case, it's temporary because he's given us festal robes for all eternity. You know, imagine now, he, Joshua can stand before the king of kings and lord of lords, and now he's not standing in shame. And see, and now, because of the righteousness of Christ, the accuser has nothing to say. Do you see that? Man, I'm telling you, God is awesome. And in verse 5, it said, Then I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments while the angel of the Lord was standing by. See, in my opinion there, you can hold your own. Christ didn't do the work. He had already done the work. He said, put these clothes on him. Put the festal robes on him. Get rid of the filthy garments. And the angel of the Lord was watching and standing by. So now what next? And the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua saying, listen to this. Okay, now, here's the thing. Get rid of his sin. See, I have taken your iniquity away. Put on the festal robes so you're presentable for the, before the king and also as an indication on how to live your life. And then now, what's next? So what is next for us? This scripture just as much applies to us as anything. And the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua saying, thus says the Lord of hosts. Did you just see that? If you will walk in my ways, and if you will perform my service, then you will also govern my house and also have charge of my courts, and I will grant you free access among these who are standing here. So now what he's saying is, okay, now look, you have forgiveness of sins. And it was by faith back then too. But now if you will walk in my ways, and if you will perform my service, then you will also govern my house. So he has a plan for Joshua and what he is supposed to do in the kingdom. So now we also as priests in this world, right, we have been saved at the foot of the cross, right, Christ took our iniquity away, then because of that we have festal robes and are supposed to live in the joy of our salvation, but then also if we will, if we will also walk in Christ's ways, and if we will perform Christ's service, so in other words, we live for Christ. We live for Christ. We're a light in a dark world. Christians means little Christs. That's what we do. We're not God, right? We are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, but we are to live for Christ. So if you will perform my service, then, okay, he has a specific purpose for Joshua. Well, he has the same thing for you. He has a purpose for your life. If you still have a pulse, you still have a purpose. Check your neighbor. Just teasing. <laughs> Guys, eternal life is ours. He already declared it. He already said it was so. Live in the joy of your salvation. Live in the festal robes. Put on a clean turban by the renewing of your mind. If you don't have assurance of your salvation, pray. Get in the word. Study, put away sin that encumbers you. Put away the distractions that makes you live an unjoyful life and live in the joy of your salvation. After David sinned in the 51st Psalm and his repentance, he said, return unto me the joy of my salvation. If you're not a believer in this room, flee this wicked generation. 
The Bible says you're going to end up in the lake of fire. And this is the holy word of God, and it's not wrong. Come to Christ. Come to Christ, and he'll take away your filthy garments. You'll be cleansed by the shed blood of Jesus, by the work on the cross, and also by looking by this vision. This vision is like a foreshadowing of the New Testament. And Christians, walk in his ways, perform his service, live in the joy of the Lord, fulfill the purpose that God created you for. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly, dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for Jesus Christ. And God, you've done prophetic scriptures and visions like this all through the Old Testament so that people in this room, Christians and people outside, can have confidence in the word of God as your word. God, thank you so much for those. Thank you those, I call those faith builders, that they give us confidence in your word, to live out your word and confidence in our salvation. But God, also, I thank you for this vision specifically. Because I think about if I had to stand in front of God with all the wicked things I have done laid out before me in front of him, I just don't, I can't imagine what that would be like. But God said, take the filthy garments off of him. Take the filthy garments off of us. Put on festal robes. Put on a clean turban. God, help us as we move forward not to get distracted by sin or anything else or by all the things going on. Help us to stay focused on walking in your ways, performing your service, and living on purpose for Christ. For we indeed are a brand plucked from the fire. In Jesus' name, amen.